Thank you for having me. Uh, it's really great to be back and speak to the community. I'm always happy if people are interested in trash, which <laughs> is <laughs> not typical, but nice. And uh, we'll try to talk to you about some of the, the overarching concepts related to trash currently in the scientific literature, and um, hopefully keep it so it's not too dour or too depressing. And um, Oscar the Grouch is a good, I think, way to get started with that. Uh, so I saw this picture on the internet. I thought it was pretty amazing. This is a, a not trash related immediately, but this is a, um, a, a cobra who is biting a python. And the python, before it died, um, was able to strangle the cobra to death. So it's kind of incredible, right? Two snakes fighting each other to the death, captured um, on the internet. Uh, lots of comments about what an incredible kind of ecological, biological interaction this was. But if you zoom out from the picture, this is the actual picture that was on the internet. Uh, so this is amazing, right? And of course, get, captures your attention. But there's a lot of other things to be said about um, the image. And it's taking place on, I don't know, what I guess is maybe a, dr a dry stream bed or something like that with, uh, with lots of garbage there. And it, like a lot of these kinds of pictures, it makes you wonder, do we just kind of accept this background and say, well, you know, life is going on, and it's going on in the context of this, of this littered environment, which we kind of don't see anymore. And I think that that's true. Uh, the, there is a phrase for this, poetically called the normative power of the actual, which means you just get used to seeing things and, and, or sensing them. And, and once you get used to it, you, you don't really notice it anymore. And I think that plastic litter has really for a long time been one of those things that we just can allow to fade into the, the background of our vision without necessarily contemplating um, some of the bigger questions about it. And the questions are, relatively straightforward, although hard to measure. Um, we want to know, uh, what is this stuff? Where is it coming from? Where is it going? What's it, what's it doing? Those are the kinds of questions we want to know. And obviously, there's, there's a lot of it. Um, so that's what we've been doing in my lab for the past couple years. We've been collecting trash from rivers and asking some pretty fundamental questions about it. Um, obviously, there's lots of different kinds of materials. Um, it's all sorts of different shapes and sizes and usage and potential for interactions with living things. Um, and we're not the only ones doing this, of course. Um, this is a, a really big subject, both in the popular press as well as in the scientific literature. And it's not just urban streams or rivers, it's um, everywhere in the world. So this is a picture from a, an isolated island uh, in the South Pacific where nobody lives. Um, this, this garbage that's covering the beaches all came from elsewhere in the world. And so the researchers who examine this question have, uh, this kind of environment have the same questions. What is this stuff, and where does it come from? What's it doing, and, and what are we gonna, gonna do about it if, if we can't do anything? And the topic of plastic litter is actually um, part of a bigger kind of picture concept, and it's uh, this concept called the Anthropocene Era. Um, the Anthropocene Era is a, an idea put forward by some geologists, and what they're indicating by saying this is that the Earth has entered a new phase in its history called the Anthropocene, the human-dominated era, and in this phase, the activity of people is now a permanent part of Earth's record. It's going to be found in the fossil record, it's be found in the sediment, in the atmosphere for all time. It's a, now a permanently part of our, our record. And so all sorts of big environmental problems are included in the Anthropocene, like uh, climate change, like the loss of biodiversity, um, changes to our oceans and, and atmosphere. Um, and then there's this other, um, uh, uh, idea here, which is novel entities, they're calling it, but really just means synthetic chemicals. So all the stuff that we produce that otherwise wouldn't have been created. And this is things like pharmaceuticals, pesticides, and also, um, also plastic. Plastic is a part of this. We now think that this is a, a big enough concept that it's a, a permanent part of our, our geologic effect on the Earth. And so what I'd like to do for this presentation is talk to you a little bit about the, the state of the global um, trash research, um, talk to you a bit about trash um, research that we've done in, in rivers um, in my lab, and then about the kind of really unexpected and, and kind of delightful ways that this has engaged our communities um, through action and public policy and education. So that's where we're going to go. Uh, so here's a study that put together the amount of plastic that was produced on Earth between 1950 and 2015. 
And you can see there's a real trend of uh, more, more plastic over that time. In fact, an accelerating rate of production. This particular graph is divided up into the polymer types or the different kinds of plastic. So you might recognize uh, PVC, PVC here, uh, high density polyethylene. These are, these are some of the really common types of plastic that are produced. So um, it's been an exponential increase in production globally um, through this period. And accordingly, the amount of plastic that's in waste, the amount of plastic that's, that's, that's uh, thrown away is, is also increasing exponentially over that same time period. So it's the same study, but in this case, they're measuring uh, estimating waste and have separated it by uh, usage type, so material type rather than polymer. And one of the uh, things that you might sort of feel makes sense is that about half the plastic that we're producing as waste is in the form of packaging material. Um, some of the other common categories are things like electronics, um, uh, textiles, all of this stuff is ending up in our waste. So the waste stream, though, can go lots of different places. And uh, they also put together, well, where does, where does the waste go? So of all the plastic we pr produced, um, about 30% is, is in use, year on year, as kind of durable plastic goods. These are things that will last a long time and that aren't thrown away after a single use. Um, about 55% of the plastic that's been produced has been um, discarded. So discarding, in this case, means going into uh, landfills or into the environment. About 8% um, has been burned, so incineration of plastic is one way in which it's dealt with. And so this is the carbon is going back up in carbon dioxide. And about 6% um, has been recycled. So it's not, we're not doing great on our recycling rates. There's a lot of room for improvement on this figure. Uh, but the other thing that, that I think is important to take home from this concept is that um, really the only way that we get rid of plastic essentially is by incineration. Um, that means all the other plastic is still with us. So about 92% um, of the plastic that's been produced ever um, is still here. It's somewhere. You know, it exists on Earth. It's in some form or another or in some place or another. And the amount of it is um, increasing exponentially. And one of the places that it's found is uh, out in the, the, the world. So this is a, a, a database that tracks research on litter, um, in particular plastic litter, and records you know, where people are doing the research and where the uh, different kinds of studies are going on and how much are, are being found. And so the research goes on globally. And really, what happens is anytime people go and look for plastic, they find it. So it's been found at the, uh, in the Arctic sea ice. It's been found in the deepest parts of the oceans um, and in the atmosphere. So, so the plastic um, um, problem I guess we could call it. Uh, we have a couple of sort of agreements that we sort of move forward with our research on. And what we say is that plastic accumulation is really a global issue. It's global in scope. It's pervasive to all parts of the world. Um, it's increasing. And on the scale of, of human lifetimes and generations, it's essentially an, a permanent feature of the environment. And so that is kind of a dour note. I know I promised not to do that. But we have to just sort of accept the situation before we can start measuring it and, and um, taking some action for it. Um, and one of the types of plastic that um, has received a lot of attention is, is microplastic. This is a relatively simple definition. It just means small plastic. In this case, the convention is about five millimeters or so. And um, it's all sorts of different kinds of materials. Here are some plastic from the, uh, oh, from the Atlantic Ocean. Here's some plastic we pulled out of a river in Chicago. And you can see there's um, lots of different kinds of stuff. We find uh, foam bits, we find these microbeads, we find these uh, jagged kind of fragments. And we also find what we call threads or filaments or, or fibers that are made of synthetic, uh, from synthetic textiles. And uh, where does it come from? Where microplastic can come from a couple different places. Sometimes plastic is produced small, and that's how it's made. Um, so the, these production pellets, you might have heard before, um, are called nurdles sometimes. These are plastic bits. They're, they usually look like disks. And they're melted down to make larger plastic items. So it's uh, virgin plastic. And sometimes these escape into the environment. We, we find these. Um, we also have plastic that's made to be small that goes into um, uh, cleaning materials. Um, some of these are consumer products, so things like toothpaste and, uh, and soaps will have plastics added to them. Um, this is something that made a lot of news a couple years ago, microbeads. Uh, these are, are being phased out in, in consumer products, uh, but they're still in use for industrial products that consumers don't interact with. 
Um, and then plastic can, microplastic can be generated from just bigger pieces of plastic that are breaking into smaller pieces. So we know plastic fragments in the environment, especially when it's exposed to sunlight, when it goes through uh, freezing and thawing cycles, it becomes kind of brittle and breaks into smaller pieces. And then one category of plastic that I feel like I didn't think much about, and I think many of us are coming to terms with, is um, the amount of synthetic textiles that we're surrounded by all the time. So um, we have synthetic textiles in the, in the carpets, in the, the, probably the, um, the chairs, um, in the drapes. Um, those are made of, of, in many cases, of plastic fibers, uh, polyethylene, acrylic, nylon, uh, polyester, and, or mixed materials. There'll be 50 of this, 50 of that. And when those fibers break off of the textiles, they're in the dust, they're in the air, they're in the water, and those are little, essentially, pieces of plastic. Um, so we get um, synthetic fibers. That's really one of the dominant types of materials we find. So those are all of the basic sources of microplastic. And um, there's been a good amount of work trying to understand how organisms, especially in the oceans, are interacting with plastic. We know that they're eaten. So plastic is eaten by, uh, microplastic is consumed by small organisms like zooplankton, all the way up to uh, baleen whales are eating microplastic. But there's some evidence for accumulation uh, from a prey item into a predator. Uh, we know that there's chemicals that like to stick to plastic surfaces that prefer kind of not to be in the water but to stick to the surface of plastic. And then uh, plastic is made um, with all sorts of chemicals embedded in it. They're so-called uh, plasticizers. These are chemicals that are added to the kind of backbone of the plastic polymer. They give the plastic different kinds of properties like heat resistance, flexibility, color. Those chemicals can sort of come out or leach out of the plastic. Um, especially in the water, and especially when it's warm. And then finally, there's been some work examining microbial communities. Here's some images that we've taken and some from the ocean, trying to understand how microbes are inter interacting with plastic and maybe being transported with plastic or um, potentially breaking down the, um, the polymers themselves. So uh, that's uh, some basic facts about the state of, of garbage science. I want to talk to you about a couple of projects we've done in, in streams um, and in some urban rivers. So when we go out to these urban rivers, uh, there is um, not a lot of understanding about how much garbage is out there in these streams or how it moves or how it gets down to the oceans. And so when we started doing this research, we were um, just asking some basic questions about garbage. Basically, we wanted to know uh, where is it and how much is there and uh, what kinds of materials are most common? Th those are fairly simple questions, and, and actually not that hard to address. We just got to get out there and start taking measurements, and so that's what, that's what we're doing. And when you go out to an urban stream, this is the north branch of the Chicago River. It's in a park, so it looks pretty nice, right? It's not that bad. Um, and you think, oh, there's not that much garbage here. Uh, and, but then when you really look more closely, uh, we find that garbage is uh, not as obvious as it may appear at first because a lot of times it's all piled together. And in many cases, it's covered by a kind of river slime uh, biofilm of algae and, and uh, bacteria. So we've got to search for it a little bit and figure out well, just where exactly is this litter. And one of the places we see it most commonly, and maybe not surprisingly, is building up in these debris dams. These are places where, uh, that naturally occur in streams. You have logs and uh, maybe turns in the stream that form a collection site where you have sediment accumulating there, um, sticks, wood, leaves. This is all the natural part of how streams operate. And these are actually important spots for the biology of streams. They offer some pools, food resources, so you find bugs and fish in these places. And, and guess what else gets accumulated and stuck along with the, um, the naturally occurring material is plastic. Um, and I wanted to show you just a little clip because it's um, not always obvious here how much is uh, there. So I've got a video clip of us pulling some plastic out. Um, what we observe is, this is a, a stick, this is in a stream in Baltimore. You see, all right, there's some leaves and some litter there. But what happens when you start to pull it away, when you're really trying to measure how much is there, we find the, the litter is stacked one piece of plastic on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. And so we're just pulling apart these layers on a, a relatively simple stick in the stream. And you can see all of the leaf litter that's mixed in with the plastic bags and food wrappers. And um, there's Ziploc bags here. Um, uh, as you just start to pull it apart, there's, there's far more there um, 
than it seems at, at first. And this was just, this was just for video. This wasn't one that we were actually measuring. I just wanted to give you some sense of, of what this actually looks like when you start pulling them apart. Um, no shortage of material. You can see there's, there was even more down at the bottom. So the way that we do that is we just go out to these streams. Here's another um, log here. That's, this has just been collecting litter. And uh, we did, we did a, a several sites around Chicago, so in, the, in and around the city. Uh, and we did the same in Baltimore. And we just go to a stream for this particular study. And we looked at a debris dam, so we found a naturally occurring site. And then an area nearby that did not have one of these debris dams. And we just collected all the garbage. Here's what it looks like before, and then here's what it looks like after we got it all out of there, uh, we have some really good sports that are working on this, uh, this subject. This is not glamorous um, scientific research to pull garbage out of a river uh, in Baltimore. Uh, and they take this stuff back. They do, we do lots of measurements. We measure the dimensions, the material type. We, do, uh, we weigh it, recording all, every single piece of litter, which can be in the thousands. And we um, have a kind of taxonomy that we use, kind of like you would with species. We identify it to uh, usage type, material type, or sometimes we can't tell, but a lot of times we can. Uh, here's a picture of it kind of laid out, being sorted. This was a non-debris dam area in the, in the, in the Chicago River. Um, just to give you a sense of what it looks like and how it's, it's really easy to overlook the material when it's in the stream. You, you just don't really see it, but it's, it's all there. Um, so there's a lot of glass here and, and various kinds of plastic. And when we're pulling this apart and looking at it and examining it, we're, we're interested in what, what's the life of the litter when it's in the streams. And what, what we notice, especially with these shopping bags, is they, uh, they are kind of stretched out, um, they're torn, and then sometimes have wrapped around each other. So we have to unwind them from one another. They form these kind of long ropes. Um, just n naturally in the stream, and they become uh, uh, lengthened, um, tight against each other, which probably affects the, the way that they may or may not break down. We observe similar kinds of uh, uh, breakdown processes with the other material we find. So the, this aluminum cans, they lose their color, they're rusting, they're changing shape. Um, there's a, a real transformation that occurs. All right, so here's... Uh, uh, one of the graphs, I just want to orient you to this graph. This is showing you the density of litter, so the number of items in a square meter. Um, in a debris dam, or all of our debris dams average together, or a non-debris dam area, and this is for Chicago, and then the same set of measurements for Baltimore. And so I just have this set up by material type. We have our classification. Um, you can see cigarettes, cloth, glass, plastic, styrofoam, et cetera. So uh, one of the things that we take home here is that, yeah, we were right about this prediction. There's a lot more plastic that's uh, litter that's accumulating in the debris dams than not. So yes, that was true. And when we look at the materials, you can see that um, uh, it's mostly plastic. So the blue color here is plastic. And then the yellow is styrofoam. Styrofoam is also plastic. It's foamed polystyrene. So, um, so almost all of this is, is, is plastic. And, and uh, in, in Chicago, we've got litter, but Baltimore is actually a lot, a lot dirtier when it comes to the amount of garbage in the, in the rivers, but certainly the same kind of pattern. Um, when we collect this material, we actually divide it up based upon where in the stream it's, it's located. We, we separate the stuff that's found at the bottom of the stream, the stuff that's floating, what's kind of trapped here above the water, um, and then what's in the riparian or the, the streamside vegetation, because we think where it ends up tells us something about how it moves through the streams. And so this is the same graph. This is for Baltimore. We've got the average density in our debris dams and non-debris dams, um, this time separated by where it's located in the debris dam. So uh, brown here, benthic, just means the surface of the stream, uh, floating on the water, and then overhanging. And then this is our streamside vegetation up there. So a lot of this stuff is kind of stuck into the debris dam, and it's above the, the water level, even though um, when we've gone out to measure it, the water's lower. And what this tells us, again, perhaps unsurprisingly, is that we think this litter is being gathered into the stream, remobilized as the floodwaters come up, shifted downstream, and stuck, kind of trapped into these um, debris dam spots. The water goes back down, and it's kind of embedded in the matrix of the leaf litter, the fine sediment. And um, it's a, a, a concept that we think of as moving and sticking. It's that simple. And that really, it makes sense because we think of lots of materials in rivers as moving this same way. So um, uh, sand, fine organic particles, we understand streams to pulse things along the way. And, and as 
as material, like plastic, like leaf litter, moves, it's occasionally retained where there might be some biological processing and then flooding again and transporting downstream. Um, so we've done a lot of follow-up studies to this. Because we know that plastic is accumulating in these debris dams, and we know these debris dams are really important sites for the biology of streams, we want to measure how the plastic is interacting with organisms that would be normally colonizing and consuming these leaves, so invertebrates and microbes. And so we've done uh, lots of different kinds of incubation studies to see if uh, uh, invertebrates are consuming the plastic, if the plastic has different um, microbial communities on it when it's mixed with the leaf litter versus not. Um, it's been a really interesting way of, of following up on the studies. Uh, but I want to tell you about a different study next. So the other one I wanted to show you was about microplastic. That's the small plastic. And in this, in this particular study, we have a bigger scale here. This study was done in eight watersheds that uh, flow into Lake Michigan. These are um, eight of the largest rivers. And we picked these um, rivers because they represent a gradient of conditions. So up here in the north, if you've ever been up north there, it's uh, forested, very rural. And then as you go down towards the southern parts of Lake Michigan, it's more agricultural, more urban. So they represent a gradient of land use. And we went out there um, seasonally uh, for a period of two years. We measured plastic in the water, uh, in the sediment, and then all of the, uh, the food web interactions here. So uh, microbes, invertebrates, and fish. And uh, we've got a great team that's, that's doing this, uh, led by uh, Dr. Uh, McNish here. And uh, when we collect the stuff, we're sometimes standing, sometimes we're in a boat uh, uh, or a canoe. And we're interested in getting the material via nets. We take grab samples, we take uh, a dredges or, or um, sediment collection devices, and we get it back into the lab. We do um, various separations by size. Um, we do a, a digestion process where we try to get rid of the organic material and leave the plastic behind so we can see it better. Um, we do some density separations, and we get them onto filters where um, we count them. We've done a lot of work recently with fish guts. So it gets better. It's not just river trash. It's also fish guts, uh, where we dissect the fish from the mouth to the anus. We remove the digestive system and then run that through our um, processing to determine microplastic in the guts. Um, and here's an idea of what, what you might see under the microscope with some of the different shapes. All right, so I'll just show you a few graphs here. This is a, uh, one of our seasons. We've got microplastic concentration in the water for our eight rivers here as they approach Lake Michigan. And it's divided up by land use, so um, we see the, the rural, the urban, and the agricultural ones. We didn't see a strong pattern of land use. Rather, it was more about orientation on the map. So the more northern um, uh, uh, rivers had less microplastic in them than the more southern, more intensively developed ones. Um, and we uh, identify the polymer types of the plastic as well. And you might recognize some of these names. You might not. I don't certainly know all of the names. There's a million different kinds of plastic. But things like they're made of things like polyethylene, polyester, various other combinations of polymer types um, in the water and in the fish. Uh, here's the fish that we've done so far. These are the species and their common names and feeding groups and how many we've digested. So at the point we put this together, we had about 161 individual fish uh, dissected and digested to analyze the uh, microplastic content in their guts. And so um, about 93% of them contained microplastic in their stomachs. So uh, it was a surprising number. And um, this was almost entirely as these fibers, the threads or filaments. And uh, it was pretty much ubiquitous across locations. So the concentrations look something like this. This is microplastic concentration as the number of particles per fish. Um, and I've divided it up here by species. So you might recognize some of these species names. And we did not find a location effect. Instead, it seemed to be that the predators had a significantly higher concentration of plastic than the, the fish that were just eating plants. So, uh, so for example, we have uh, pumpkin seed up there. Um, another, uh, this is a sport fish, the bass. Um, one that we've done some more studies with, the goby. This is an invasive um, fish in Lake Michigan. And then a few others. So what we think is there's a potential role for, for diet or feeding strategy that's um, determining microplastic ingestion. And um, we're, we're, we've done a lot more fish since then and, and find really the pattern does hold up. So for example, this is just one bluegill with 52 fibers in its stomach. And the bluegill is, is it's not that big. Um, and the, the pattern has held up for the others. 
So our take home points from this study so far is that uh, uh, microplastic varied among the water in our rivers, but it was ubiquitous in the fish. And rather than being related to location, it seemed to be related to the way they were eating. Um, we're doing some, some interesting follow-up studies with this as well. I have a student here, Lauren, who's working at the Field Museum, um, who has uh, generously donated some of their historical specimens. So we want to know, um, what does the pattern look like for microplastic ingestion going back in time? And so the Field Museum has an, a really nice specimen uh, record for some of the most common uh, fish around Chicago. So we've taken some of these 100-year-old fish and dissected their guts and done the same analysis. And um, we see some plastic in their stomachs after the mid-century, and we've got some more to add to this. So she's been doing that. And also feeding some plastic fibers to fish and seeing how long does it stay in their stomach or, or does it come right out. So we're going to see what, that, what happens with that. And another student who's examining larger fish from the Ohio River um, and a few other places to really follow up on this idea of um, the food web and how different kind of levels of feeding for fish might affect their microplastic load in their stomach. All right. So I want to uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the unexpected outcome of this research, which I've really enjoyed, which has been the way that people are interested. So I guess you are a testament to this, to spend a Friday evening learning about plastic. Um, yeah, but also people really uh, everywhere, especially the, um, the, the students that we work with, are really interested in the subject and really engaged in understanding the facts, coming up with ideas, and, and I think keeping a, an optimistic out, outlook. And so the, the first sort of list here I want to mention is some of the public policies that have been generated as this field of research has been developing. Some of these um, exist, and some of these, I think, are coming up. And so uh, the first one is, I think, maybe the most famous example, which was about microbeads. Um, and this was done uh, essentially really by an early study in the Great Lakes and some um, in the coastal ocean, where researchers were finding these little beads that looked exactly like the beads they were finding um, in soap and tracking them through the wastewater treatment process and out into our waterways. And um, it really caught on. Shortly after that paper was published, there was some state government activity uh, banning these products for use in consumer products, and then it was followed up by a federal, uh, federal legislation really quickly and, and really through grassroots. So this was, a, a, I think, a quick translation from science to the public to policy, and um, they are being phased out of consumer products. So you might still see them, but they can't be produced anymore. So a success, I think, a, a really um, uh, great example of science communication. Um, another one that's ongoing in a more disparate way through mostly local governments is policies related to shopping bags. So I don't know what the policies are around here, but they're a little bit different everywhere. Um, where I live in Chicago, there's a seven cent tax on bags. Um, this went into effect, I think, about a year and a half ago. And the city put out some data to show uh, here are the customers using disposable bags before the tax and then after in Chicago and then elsewhere. There's no change and the same with them using reusable bags. So this seven cent tax has caused um, a demonstrable change in um, consumer habits. There are other policies for other cities where they're banned outright or uh, uh, they're being phased out, um, but this is the, the strategy that's been used in Chicago. Um, another one that we've seen some positive results for have to do with cigarettes. So cigarette butts um, are one of the most common items we find on our beaches. So we work with a group called the Alliance for the Great Lakes. They run beach cleanups all over the Great Lakes and have been doing this for about 15 years or so. And it's great that they clean up litter, but it's even better that they have the volunteers write down what they find. So they have a, a data sheet that they tally up with different categories. So we've been analyzing the data from these volunteers. And we've shown from a period of about 2002 to 2015, this is the, um, the amount of litter that is cigarettes on the beaches. So it's uh, gone down. It's gone down in Chicago and in Evanston and, and uh, other places in the uh, kind of Lake Michigan area. Uh, so what is this correlated with? We don't know. In Chicago, there was a ban on smoking on the beaches in 2008. So if you look at this, maybe 2000, before 2008, after 2008, maybe, maybe there's something there. But you really can't separate that one law from the kind of cultural shift that's going on with cigarette smoking, which is a clear decrease in cigarette smoking rates, which have to do with public education, which have to do with public policies related to smoking in government buildings and offices. All of these things are a composite effect. And there's a real clear impact on lung cancer rates going down. And we can show there's a clear impact on environmental health. There's less cigarette butts on the beaches. So 
So these policies, disparate though they are, are, are having an environmental impact. Um, so these are, are kind of ongoing. There's some that are coming up relating to washing machines, straws, and then generally about single-use plastics. Uh, so you might have heard of this, the Cora Ball. There's another one from Patagonia. Uh, these are devices that go into your washing machine. And why would you want to stick something in your washing machine? Well, this is because of the um, synthetic textiles that are going into the washing machine. When you wash something like a fleece or something like those, you know, those really nice fuzzy blankets uh, that are made of plastic, when those go in the washing machine, they release lots of fibers. Those little fibers are going into the water and then down the drain. Many of them are captured in the wastewater treatment plant, but many also get out into the environment. So washing machine effluent, the water, is a source of microplastic from fibers. And so there's a product here you can throw in with your wash that's supposed to catch those fibers. Um, somebody else had told me that she wraps a uh, pantyhose around her um, tube that's coming out of the washing machine. You know, some people have it going into this kind of big sink in the basement, something like that, and uh, to catch fibers so it doesn't go down the drain. Um, and she was also saying that there was an older washing machine that had a, a lint trap in the tube, um, just like you would have for your dryer. Um, I don't know where those uh, policies are going to go or what's going to happen, but these are ways that people, I think, were mostly interested in protecting their pipes, but I have the benefit of, of, um, of reducing some of the plastic load into the pipes as well. Uh, the straw thing is the big one. Uh, in Chicago, it was, it was led by the Shedd Aquarium, which is a big uh, institution in the city. They call it Shed the Straw, and they had a successful lobbying campaign for uh, restaurant groups, for some of the sporting um, groups, to remove plastic straws, to come up with this idea that they're available on request, or they're paper alternatives. There's different ways of trying to um, meet the, the need for straws, by, uh, but, but still reducing the, the use of plastic straws in such, such a ubiquitous way. And I feel like this plastic straw thing has taken off, right? This is just, I don't know, six months, a year? It hasn't really been that long that you've been hearing about straws, right? But it, it happened fast. And it's ongoing with something like McDonald's, uh, Starbucks. These are, these are really large um, uh, producers of plastic waste. Uh, and the, um, the idea of single-use plastics as being um, something an institution should examine is also something that's been gaining steam. So this was, again, with my um, collaborators at the Shed, this was something they told me about, that zoos and aquariums um, globally are assessing their um, plastic use institutionally. At our university, um, it's been led by an institute for environmental sustainability that assesses poli all policies related to disposable single-use plastics. So this means assessing um, catering, um, vending, uh, uh, um, uh, food service, all of the places that the material might be used and coming up with strategies and ways to have it reduced. And so um, this is, I guess, a little bit more of a grassroots rather than a public policy type of process, but when it's incorporated into things that are uh, like schools, like um, uh, government offices, I think there's a momentum for the assessment to occur and that maybe at some point this will be um, a, a policy in some fashion or another to consider, to examine, to reassess an institution's relationship with single-use plastics. Um, is the relationship working? Is it not working? How could we make this relationship better? Something like that. Uh, the other thing that we've had a really nice um, uh, sort of product and success and I think momentum going with uh, plastic assessment in the environment is with citizen scientists. These are volunteers who collect data. This is something that's been done for a long time with birds, with uh, bees, people who are interested in flowers and when flowers show up in different times of the year. There's databases, there's organizations that allow people to record their observations and then scientists can go and analyze that data. It generates really big data sets with lots more information than we can otherwise get. And we've done the same um, with garbage. So we, like I said, work with the Alliance for the Great Lakes, who, where these citizen scientists are collecting litter data and with the Friends of the Chicago River. And from that, we were able to generate this kind of graph. This is, this is the action of tens of thousands of individuals over a period of 15 years over all over the, the Great Lakes. And so, so we, I could never generate a data set like this, but collectively, by um, sort of harnessing the, the crowdsourcing momentum of engagement, we can, we can do it, and we can really learn from this in a way that we couldn't learn any other way. Uh, I've worked with a similar group in Bozeman. This is an organization called Adventure Scientists. They get people who like to go climb mountains and, and, and boat all over the world to collect data. 
So they, did, they decided to do a, product, a project where they live, which is in um, Montana, uh, and they had citizen scientists, adventurers, climb up into the mountains, get water from these streams that come down from Yellowstone and up in the mountains and all over the watershed, and uh, all at the same time, and they did this for a period of a couple years, and we've been analyzing their data. Uh, and then finally, I, I just want to point out that, the, that at every step, at least in our analysis and in many other researchers that do this, we, we, we really want this to be an educational process. So litter, garbage science, may not be a student's first choice when they come into the university, uh, but many of them are motivated to contribute in this way. And we've had a really great group of students that have, that have done this, and I think it should be mandated for, for um, research funding where, in institutions where it's applicable. And we've also been able to work with education professors to, um, to incorporate the study of litter as a way of teaching the scientific method. So uh, the student here will talk about garbage in the environment, and then the, the students in the class, these are elementary school students, they come up with questions. And um, they ask the same questions that we ask, the exact same questions. <laughs> How do you know where the garbage is? Yeah, that's exactly what we want to know. And then they ask them to make predictions. They say, well, if there's plastic in your hand, how does it end up in a bird? And the students have to come up with a, a model, and they come up with these fun scenarios of how they think the plastic made it through the world and ended up. But that's a, um, essentially a hypothesis, a set of testable predictions. And they can walk through the scientific method and talk about global change and about an, an individual's role in conservation. Uh, and we've worked, again, with the Friends of the Chicago River in this advertising agency. They came up and got some garbage from the lab, the microplastic, and they want to do something called microprinting, uh, where they talk about facts about litter and then <laughs> project these onto the buildings uh, in the city. So we'll, we'll see if that happens. They, they have the plastic. Uh, we have not seen the projections yet, but this is a way of, um, I think, using this for public education campaigns. So we've been able to engage lots of different people, from, from students to volunteers to, um, uh, to, to children. And so uh, in closing this little section, I came up with a couple of nuggets. This is new, but I thought, well, I need a few closing nuggets of wisdom. And when I was little, we watched the uh, Fraggle Rock. Did you guys watch the show, Fraggle Rock? So Fraggle Rock's about a bunch of Muppets that live in underground, and... Uh, when they have a question, they can't figure things out, they, they don't know what to do, they go out into the world and they talk to the trash heap. This trash heap, she talks, um, and she's like wise, and she offers them you know, advice on solving their problems. Usually she's kind of singing it in a bluesy and a song, she's telling them what to do. And I thought, well, wisdom from the trash heap makes sense as we close it out. And if, if you're hoping to communicate about this issue to people, and talk about um, wh where you think we go from here. I often try to say, well, one of the, one of the conclusions we found as we've examined this material is that there's, there's many different sources. There's lots of different places that litter, that plastic in the environment is coming from. And what that means is there's lots and lots of different solutions. There's no real single way to reduce it or eliminate it or, or get rid of it. There's, there's a million, and so all of them are valuable. Um, we, we all contribute to this process. Just by being a consumer in this culture at this time, we all are producing waste. And so none of us are separate from it. We're all part of the problem, which means we're all also um, part of the solution. And we value and contribute really anyone's contribution towards those, um, those solutions. And that what I found is that there is a real reasonable reaction to this issue, which is to feel sad and feel depressed and feel overwhelmed by its scope. And I get it, you know, that, that is an understandable thing, but it doesn't really help anybody. So uh, what I've found is that the, the, the change, the education, the research, the engagement is really only possible if you keep up the spirit of optimism and inclusivity. And that it, maintaining this is really prerequisite towards us getting anywhere. And so, you can think about all of these couple of things. There's lots of sources, lots of problems. Everybody's welcome to contribute. And you know, with a kind of positive attitude and cooperation, as the trash heap would say, uh, you know, we, can, we can get to somewhere uh, that's better than where, than where we are. So, uh, so that kind of wraps it up. I want to make sure to thank everybody. We've had lots and lots and lots of students uh, working on these research projects. They're dealing with dirty garbage from dirty rivers, so they <laughs> do a really great job. Collaborators and students, and we've had a, a really a lot of support from institutions, um, uh, local governments, and from funding agencies.
So thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to talk more. Uh, should we do microphones? Yeah, we'll, yeah. Okay. Then. Oh, we're, you're, we're. So which clothing is environmentally <laughs> safe to wear? Is it only cotton? <laughs> Uh, I don't know. Maybe we want to wear no clothes going forward. It's the same thing to do. Um, that's a good question. Uh, uh, this, I, this issue of the textiles is really a difficult one because it's not just clothing. It's all of our textiles. So you think about this carpet, for example, is, is probably made of plastic, and there's probably chemicals put into that plastic. So it's not just what we put on our bodies. It's kind of what we, all of the fabrics we surround ourselves with. Um, but certainly we imagine that the degradation rates for natural materials like wool and cotton are going to be faster. There are microbes that are, that are capable of decomposing those polymers more quickly than, than most of our synthetic polymers. Um, and many fabrics, it's hard to tell what's in there. They're mixtures. They're, they're part rayon, part um, uh, acrylic. There's, there's, a, there's a lot of mixtures. But, but I think you, know, you, you could choose what you want to phase in and out of your wardrobe over time. Uh, and if you want to make this a more environmentally conscious friendly choices, you could think about natural fibers. You could think about this issue of, of washing the clothes, and washing especially things like those big blankets, drapes, um, large textiles that are made of synthetic fabrics. So I just want to say, when you get a microphone, realize there's one person in front of you, because that's how this works. We have two microphones, so when you get the microphone for a question, wait until the person in front of you has asked their question. I think I'm next. Is it on? I see the microphone, yeah. Oh. Okay. Um, could you comment on burning plastic? Burn Talk into the end. Can you comment on burning plastic? I can comment on it. I don't know all of the byproducts that, are, that come out of plastic when it's burned. Incineration of plastic is something that's, that's done uh, you know, worldwide as a way of managing waste, just burning garbage, generally speaking. So it is a waste management strategy. Uh, it can reduce the mass. With plastic, we know that it, it's incineratable. It's, it's meltable. It's ultimately um, hydrocarbons. It's oil. So uh, a good portion of it will be converted back into carbon dioxide. The concern, though, with incineration is all of the other chemicals that are in there and incomplete oxidation of the plastic uh, polymers. They can break down even smaller than microplastic into nanoplastic that you, you, you can't see at all um, that is capable of crossing a uh, cell membrane, for example. So I would be um, concerned about the uh, exhaust that comes off from burning plastic. Uh, is it petty to bury it? Maybe there's less air pollution, uh, but it'll be down there for, for who knows how long. Certainly that's, that's essentially what we've decided. We're, we're burying plastic mostly is what we do with it. Um, and maybe it'll stay there and be buried forever. <laughs> maybe not. Certainly the degradation rates are, are hundreds of years for biological degradation. And it does degrade more quickly in the environment when it's exposed to sunlight, but it, it breaks into smaller pieces. And those smaller pieces have kind of different toxic properties than the larger pieces. Hello. I, I wonder if you'd allow me to make a comment uh, of what I think is the most serious aspect of this whole thing. Uh, 30 years ago, I brought a federal Clean Water Act lawsuit uh, that would have corrected this in federal court. And the lawsuit lasted for 20 years. Uh, government and industry fought me tooth and nail to allow it to continue. Most of it is caused by stormwater runoff. But I want to discuss how it affects the atmosphere. We all know that we're warming the earth with CO2, and driving here, we probably put hundreds of pounds of pollution into the atmosphere. The atmosphere consists of 21% oxygen. If it diminishes by 3%, it's game over. So oxygen loves to get diluted. So all these chemicals that we're putting in the air, a billion cars, our factories, our power plants, dilute that oxygen level. And some areas of the world are already at about 17%. But as this stuff gets to the ocean, there's machines that make oxygen, replenish oxygen. One is forests. They've been cut in half by half. And the other is phytoplankton. Phytoplankton supplies 75% of all the air on the planet. Every second breath we breathe. 
This plastic, as it gets to the ocean, homogenizes, mixes with PCBs, and in my lifetime, phytoplankton has diminished by 40%. 40%. It has taken billions of years for phytoplankton to create all life on this planet and most of the oxygen. 40% in my lifetime because it's ingesting or being exposed to this plastic mixed with PCBs. So I think, I think we really should take this a little more serious. It's really a big problem. And 90% of it is stormwater runoff, which the government deemed is legal. And, and re related to the atmosphere, there is um, kind of emerging research on, on dust. So indoor dust and outdoor dust that contains uh, uh, plastic fibers that can come down in the rain. So that's something we don't entirely understand also related to global transport. Your uh, data showed that 19 billion pounds per year of plastics end up in the ocean or go from the streams into the ocean. What percentage of that goes to the bottom? And once it goes to the bottom, does it get incorporated into the strata and the bottom and become uh, bioinactive, or does it continue to be bioactive by the microorganisms in the bottom? Yeah, we, don't, we don't have a good number for that fraction. We, when we dig, so we've done some, some layers in the soil, in the, especially the streamside area. Um, when we dig, we, f we find l l deposited layers of plastic. How long it's been there, we don't know. It's, it's hard to age these types of things. Um, but presumably, it can um, last hundred, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, especially when it's, when it's in the dark and um, without any sort of physical abrasion going on. Um, so I would think it's a relatively permanent feature of the, the soil and, and potentially the stream bed. What percentage of the 19 billion goes down? Uh, we, uh, we don't know. We don't have a good number on that. And we don't have, well, we're just beginning all of these, and they're, even those numbers are, are just pretty rough estimates. And presumably, it'd be pretty variable from place to place as well. But we would like to know how much is retained, buried, and how much is exported, and get an idea of that, of that <laughs> fraction. Because yeah. certainly, dealing with it on land is, is difficult, but it's easier than dealing with it in the ocean. It's, it's sort of lost, lost once it's in the ocean. Hello. Uh, given yes. that you... Uh, uh, I began your first. talk by referring to uh, this new Anthropocene era that we're in, and given that humankind, in large measure, is really an invasive species that <laughs> came onto this planet fairly late in the uh, long uh, history of evolution, uh, could a reasonable case be made that one way to reduce the uh, impact of uh, the Anthropocene era uh, particularly including the disposal of uh, plastics and, and drugs into our fresh water, the air, and the, so forth, would be uh, birth control. And maybe on a uh, much more rigorous uh, 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 agenda than our current federal administration seems willing to uh, consider. Well, I would leave, uh, I guess, family planning up to the family that makes those plans. But certainly more people generally means more litter, and it's always been that way for people. I think where we have the chance to innovate our way into reducing these things is with, with new products, with new policies, and new cultural norms about how we, how we sort of conduct ourselves and how we deal with our food and how we manage our transportation. So, so I, I'm not totally pessimistic that we just need less people. I think, I think, we, can, I think we can innovate and, and legislate to some degree our way into a, a lower footprint. I'd like to think that also, anyway. Yes, uh, two things. Uh, one, uh, I recently wrote a, an article about plastics pollution for Main Street Magazine, which is a regional magazine probably a lot of people know. And I said something in it that I quoted, I, I believe it was from The Atlantic, maybe The Guardian. It said, our supermarkets are really only an excuse to sell plastic. If you walk through a plastic, or through a, through a supermarket, Everything is in plastic, and there were photographs in the article of aisle after aisle, uh, from the produce to the cosmetics to uh, juices and so on. And, and it, it is endemic, and there aren't really choices for people at this point. So it really needs to start at the top, and, and uh, half of the country believes that climate change and pollution are uh, a, a fiction. 
The second thing is, you haven't mentioned nanoparticles. You, you talk about microplastics. Nano is even smaller. And could you comment on nano? Uh, sure, Particle sure. contamination? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I've mentioned the, the shopping litter as well, the, that um, there's been a real focus on the, the bag, the shopping bag, but there's a lot of, the, most of the plastic is in the packaging of the foods. And I think acknowledging that is, is, is step one, you know, towards perhaps better policies and, and things. Um, as related to nanoplastic, this is a, a really new emerging era, era research uh, arena. The plastic, when it gets to microplastic, it doesn't stop breaking down, you know, there are, it can break into continuously smaller pieces, and it reaches the next size class that we call nanoplastic. And nanoparticles, nanoplastic included, are um, a concern especially because they can be much more biologically reactive, especially that they can be um, transmitted through and into a cell. And so there's been some work with um, human cell cultures and nanoplastic, and they're finding um, uptake of the nanoplastic particles by, the, by neural cells. Um, what that means, we have, we have no idea. As far as I know that we don't have any assessments of what are the human health or cellular processes that might be affected by nanoplastic particles in our cells. Um, so it's, it's a, it's a. Uh, so now find the nanoparticles in proton chains, cytokines, which are the cells in the cell. Yeah. So it goes from there right up the food chain to the top. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you've got, um, you've got a lot of. I can't see. Oh, are you in the back? Oh, I'm, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't know I was next. I was waiting for the other person. Um, can you do you know anything about what the plastics industry, or the American Plastics Council, in our little village of uh, Hastings downstate, we put a ban on plastic bags, and the grocery store put I don't know what group it was, but their, you know, high-powered attorney came in and said, no, you can't ban plastic bags. The Americans Plastics Council seems, no, we all have to live with plastics. Mm -hmm. um, the graduate, 1960, whatever it was, <laughs> one yeah, word, plastic. So is the industry itself doing anything to mitigate or solve this problem? Uh, well, I, you know, I can't speak for the industry. Uh, my experience in, in doing the research of being at conferences, for example, is there's generally representatives of the plastic industry present at, at scientific conferences that deal with the, the issue, and they have points to bring up that are um, contrary <laughs> to what we might promote as, as less plastic use. So, so certainly they're um, involved in the discussion in ways that I, I don't entirely understand. Um, I, I get contacted here and there about these local plastic bans and offer a letter or support, and a lot of times there is a rebuttal from someone I assume is being paid by the industry. And there's been some speculation that um, these changes in plastic straws might be just turned into a different kind of plastic attached to the cup, so there may not be a reduction in overall plastic usage. Um, so th this is something I, d I don't know entirely, but I think it's uh, very reasonable to suspect all of those activities that you suspect are going on. Um, uh, you had some data on sort of the nature and the origin and use of the plastic in terms of its chemical nature and, and what it's used for, and also, of course, at the tail end, you know, where it's ending up, how it's ending up in the rivers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I'd like to ask about a question in the middle, and I'm not sure if you have data on it or even if it's relevant. And I'm asking in part because I'm on the board of the Ulster County Resource Recovery Agency, so we're kind of in charge of the trash collection system okay. in Ulster County. And the question is, is there any sense as to whether or not that, that middle step when we, when we handle trash, you know, I'm trying to figure out why that stuff gets into the stream and what we can do to stop it, assuming that it gets used, which it is getting used and it's gonna to continue to get used. Yeah. And the question is, is it by and large a fault of the trash stream itself? In other words, from the point where somebody puts it into a bin of some sort, recycle bin or a garbage can to a truck that gets picked up to a, transfer station to yeah. a landfill, is, is the plastic coming out during that process more, or is it getting into the stream because somebody doesn't put it into that process and gets, somehow gets out the back door and never gets into what I would call generally our facilities? And mm -hmm. I'm asking because if we can tighten up this, we can solve some of this problem by tightening up our facilities, that's something I would very much like to know. Mm -hmm. now, this, do, I, do I need better trucks? Do I need better landfills? Do I need better transfer stations, or is it just 
it, or, or is the situation that once it gets in there, it's good, but the problem is it doesn't get in there? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's both. I mean, I, I'm not an expert in the waste management um, process or wastewater management, but, but the, the leakiness of the waste stream from the bin to the landfill is certainly something that's been documented in different places. Things are lost along the way to some degree, and some ships are tighter than others, I would assume, in terms of how those operations run. Um, so some of it has to do with our waste management process. And a lot of it, I believe, is, um, is, 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 is littering. People leave stuff around. <laughs> and uh, that's a hard thing to try to stop. Or, or people put things next to a garbage can. You know, you see a lot of this going on. And I see it in the city all the time. It's around the garbage can. Um, and it doesn't get in there, ultimately. And so it's, uh, it's, it's both of those things. It's, it's our waste management process, which is a difficult and expensive thing to do and, and, and important. And it's also the cultural norms as it relates to how we, how we deal with our, our garbage. And it's, it's nothing new. I think this, is, this has been going on um, as long so as it's people So in your view, it's worthwhile for us to look into the ways that th this yes. material is leaking out of the yep. transfer system at each stage. Yeah. Yeah, my take is there's many sources, many solutions. So that includes our waste management process. And it includes how we teach people to deal with their litter and the cultural norms as best we can with how they're managed. Yeah, so every step of that process, I think, is worth addressing uh, because it's, it's, all, it's all contributing. Hi. If I just might comment on that, for the last seven years, I've done river cleanup. Oh, great. And I love doing it. Uh -huh. um, and I find it's my personal experience, so it's not any associations. It's my personal experience that municipalities don't have a they don't have enough money yeah. to have proper resources to have proper cans to have proper pickups mm -hmm. in time after a weekend the garbage is overflowing it just goes into the river mm -hmm. i've seen it time after time mm -hmm. containers aren't tight they're not proper containers yeah. i've seen it in many uh, hudson river towns my comment on a hopeful note is that I just heard last week that Great Barrington banned the plastic water bottle. Oh. And I think that's exciting, and I think it says that we as consumers can stop a lot of this plastic. Mm -hmm. We can write to these companies and say, we don't want the over-plastic tightened um, uh, wrappings, that we don't, we're not gonna buy the water, we're not gonna use a plastic bag, and so we as consumers have a lot of power, we just mm -hmm. have to use it. Mm -hmm. I agree. Oh, I have one oh, we got a microphone. Mine's, m is it working? Mine's uh, pretty simple. Um, I live on an island huh? and um, won't get into that, but, <laughs> but a lot of uh, advertising on the island, et cetera, is they're pushing now that the, the plastic that holds the six packs together and everything that is actually the fish and plankton and everything can eat. Are you familiar with that? Mm -mm. And that it, some of the plastic they're actually developing uses cornstarch or something to that point, mm -hmm. so it breaks down. So maybe we should be putting the squeeze on the manufacturers to accelerate their uh, research into, you know, the alternatives. Yeah. Or so if it gets into the stomachs, we have tons of turtles and whales and everything that they're just filled with plastic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. so. There is a lot of chemical engineering that, that goes on to determine um, two perhaps more environmentally components of the plastic. One is to have it, it's made as plastic but made from um, plants rather than from hydrocarbons. So that the source material is biological, even though the product ends, is the same chemical. The other end of that is to come up with plastics that might be more biodegradable. There's a concern that some of those are um, plastics embedded with biodegradable pieces so that they just turn into microplastic in the environment. Um, so maybe aren't a solution in that way. Uh, but there is, what I hear is, is a lot of attempts at innovating uh, the source materials and the, the composition. Um, for different usages of plastic. Yeah. So we're going to have one more question because it's 10 past 8, and I would like to respect that it's Friday night and people might want to get up. <laughs> All right, I, I, will make this, I will make this quick. Obvious a lot, obviously, a lot of us here have been around for a while. So over the last 50 years, with all the plastic we've been using and being around, are there studies 
of current autopsies and so forth of how much we might have absorbed in our systems now. And that's kind of how I became interested in this because with the straw thing and I was talking to some other scientist friends about just drinking out of plastic bottles, misusing a microwave, <laughs> Tupperware. Obviously, yeah. I'm terrified, but I'd like to know your point of view. Yeah, there is a lot of interest in that. And um, as far as I know, there isn't any sort of conclusive health studies on, on, on people in, ingesting plastic and what the effects are, even what the amounts are. But there is a, a, a sort of a spate of recent studies on plastic in, in food. So plastic in water, in soda, in salt, in beer, um, that there, there, that is kind of ubiquitous in our food. So undoubtedly, we are ingesting plastic to some degree. Because of uh, the packaging, so for example, with the sea salt, um, it's dried seawater, and so there's plastic in the seawater, so it's in the salt. Uh, the plastic is in the, the pipes, in the tubing, in the processing plants, in the dust, and so it's there. We've been, we've been eating it for a long time, so probably you know, we, we're getting it. Um, but what the, what the human health effects are conclusively, we don't know. But it's a, a great question, and a lot of people are curious, and I, I, I am too. Yeah. So I'd like to thank Dr. Holine again <laughs> for a great talk. Thank you. Uh, 